some of the most renowned figures of ancient Greek drama. The Caius of Eretria, a tragic poet of the 5th century, successfully competed in Athens against both Sophocles and Euripides. Euripides is even thought to have drawn, drawn on his work, and Achaeus' satyr plays are considered second only to those of Aeschylus. Meniscus of Chalcis, a tragic actor and contemporary of Achaeus, also found success on the Athenian stage. Meniscus was a preferred performer of Aeschylus and is the only non-Athenian actor to gain fame in the 5th century. Lycophron of Chalcis, a tragic poet of the 3rd century, was active in Alexandria and is included among the seven canonical tragedians of the Hellenistic period known as the Pleiad. <coughs> Finally, Apollodorus of Charistos, a comic poet of the 3rd century, competed in Athens and won the prize there on five occasions. Apollodorus was considered one of the five canonical poets of New Comedy and is the only other Greek playwright that Terence deemed worthy of adaptation for the Roman stage. Each of these juggernauts of Greek drama made their mark on the Athenian and Alexandrian stage, but we have no notion of how the dramatic traditions of Euboea might have shaped their work. To better understand this important alternative tradition of dramatic production, this talk, this talk provides a foundation for reconstructing a diachronic model of Euboea's theatrical identity. This model traces developments in the local production of drama in the late classical, Hellenistic, and Roman periods and sheds new lights on Euboean theater. It will propose several key cornerstones of Euboean drama on which new evidence can build. I will demonstrate that Euboea had an agonistic and itinerant theatrical culture that included the production of comedy, tragedy, and satyr play. Evidence for this production runs from the early 4th century BCE to the 1st century CE. Finally, I will outline Euboea's appreciation for Athenian drama while also maintaining that the relationship was competitive rather than dependent. Since no surviving dramatic texts can be linked to a Euboean performance context, an interdisciplinary study of the relevant material record provides the basis for my model. The focus of this analysis is small-scale terracotta sculpture, with consideration given to both actor figurines and theatrical masks, with, with a Euboean provenience. 
But terracotta represents only one facet of my approach. My reconstruction is made more complete by consideration of the relevant epigraphic and architectural evidence. These supplementary considerations fill important gaps in our knowledge that cannot be gained from the choroplastic evidence alone. It is with this evidence that I begin my reconstruction. A series of late classical choragic dedications found near the theater at Eretria attests to a strong local tradition of choral performance throughout the fourth century. The fact that many of these were designed to hold tripods further suggests that these performances were agonistic in nature. But, this is, but it is not until the end of the fourth century that we get our first epigraphic indications of local theatrical production. The earliest evidence may in fact be a partial base for an honorary statue bearing the inscription Menandros. This base was found near the theater at Eretria and can be dated according to letter forms to the late 4th or early 3rd century. Based on its fine context and the limited evidence for the local use of this name, we can assume that the statue honors the prolific Athenian comic poet whose production period was the last quarter of the 4th century and first decade of the third. As Sebastiano Nervania has observed, an honorary statue is surely indicative of local in-person production. The local production of Menandrian plays indicates an interest in a particular type of Athenian comedy. That is, situational comedy focused on the oikos, stock characters with markedly human faults, plots focused on obstacles to young love, and themes involving the fickleness of fortune. These features are centric to what we have eventually come to define as the genre of Greek new comedy. The other critical epigraphic evidence is what I, what I will refer to as the Chalkis Decree. This decree was inscribed on a marble stele found near the temple of Apollo Daphnophorus in Eretria. Thanks to an internal reference to Demetrian currency, it can be precisely dated somewhere between 294 and 288. This decree outlines the annual hiring, compensation, itinerary, and legal rights of a single cohort of diverse performers. These performers were collectively employed by four Euboean cities to compete in a perennial festival circuit. After plans were finalized in Chalkis in the fall, the circuit began in the early winter with the Dionysia in Karistos. It then continued north with the Dionysias of Eretria, Chalkis, and Histiaia Orios. After the Dionysia circuit was complete, the performers worked their way back through the same cities in reverse order for the Demetriaia, an annual festival in honor of Demetrius Polyorchides. By the late spring, they would have arrived back in Karistos. There, they were retained to participate in the Christian Aristonikeia, a festival dedicated to a local hero and companion of Alexander. For the present discussion, this inscription is crucial because comic and tragic troops are included among the performers to be hired. It therefore confirms the local interest in comedy suggested by the Eretria Menander base and provides our earliest epigraphic evidence for the local performance of tragedy. More importantly, the fact that four Euboean cities were able to hire the same performers suggests that there must have been common expectations from dramatic performances. This speaks to the existence of a performance tradition at the regional level. <coughs> The decree also stipulates that steles bearing the inscription be erected in the theaters at Oreos, Calchis, Eretria, and Karistos. We therefore know that each of these cities had their own permanent performance spaces. However, only the theater at Eretria is sufficiently preserved to inform the present discussion. In discussing this theater, I work from the assumption that, like other broadly defined geopolitical regions of mainland Greece, Euboea's theater may have shared a distinct architectural unity that may be represented by the performance venue at Eretria. Uh, yeah, this is washed out. Uh, 
this is the plan of um, Retria. These are the city walls out here. <clears throat> the theater of Retria is situated in the northwest corner of the city, just north of a 4th century temple of Dionysus. The theater's spatial relationship to the temple recalls the theater and sanctuary of Dionysus Eleutherius in Athens. Uh, so that's up here, you've got the theater, and the temple is right above there. <clears throat> the Retria's south-facing theater was medium-sized and could accommodate as many as 6,400 spectators. Throughout its evolution, it was variously constructed with a combination of wood, mud brick, poros, limestone, and marble. The most recent work on the theater, published by Hans Peter Isler and Eliza Ferroni, provide a chronology for three distinct phases. The first can be dated to around 325 BCE. Here, we can probably reconstruct a beaten earth orchestra in a koilon comprised of tiered wooden benches erected on a gentle slope. A pie-shaped skene, roughly 30 meters by 10, had a mud brick superstructure erected on a stone foundation. Uh, so we don't really know what the koilon looked like, but you can see here the initial uh, plan <coughs> for the first phase of the skene. The second phase dates to around 300. At this time, the theater was outfitted with stone and the orchestra was sunk at a depth of just over 3 meters. Koilan took the form of a stilted half circle and now included 30 rows of seats divided into 11 kerkides by 12 stairways. The orchestra was given its circular shape and was defined in part by the addition of a semicircular drain on its northern edge. This phase also saw the addition of an underground tunnel which led from the center of the orchestra to the inside of the newly added proskenion. The new proskenion communicated with the back wall of the skene through a massive vault running through its center. Uh, and you can barely make out uh, the uh, paradoi here and a few of the stairways. This little dot in the middle, that's the center of the orchestra. Uh, and the tunnel, which is completely washed out, uh, you can see the two ends uh, opened up here in the orchestra and snuck just behind the proskenion wall there. The third and final phase um, dates somewhere in the middle of the 2nd century BC. This was largely a repair effort, perhaps associated with damage from the Roman siege of the city during the Second Macedonian War in 198. Several walls associated with the stage buildings were replaced, more marble was incorporated, and the Periscania were redesigned. At this point, we can definitively say that Thyromata were added to the front face of the skate. This theater, paired with the knowledge gained from the epigraphic evidence, provides practical details about local uh, theatrical production, allowing us to compare it to Athenian production. The diameter of the orchestra, at about 18 and a half meters, is only slightly smaller than that of the Lycurgan phase at Athens. We can therefore assume it could similarly accommodate at least 50 performers at a time, as was required for Athenian dithyrambic competition. It was certainly sufficient for the much smaller choruses associated with theatrical productions that were comprised of only 12 to 24 performers. This orchestra, paired with the provision of a skene and eventually proskenia, also meant that this theater could accommodate the essential elements for the production of most Athenian dramas as we know. This theater, however, is somewhat distinct, both in its ample provisions for stage effects and for its unusually deep stage. The local interest in visual effects is made most explicit by the inclusion of the 13 meter subterranean tunnel under the orchestra. This tunnel provided a unique underground access point to the orchestra from an entrance hidden from the audience's view within the skene. This tunnel can be reasonably associated with what Julius Pollux calls Chironian steps, which, he suggests, could be used for the dramatic entrance of underworld ghosts. A 
Another indication of an interest in stage effects are apparent bases set just north of each of Pyroscania's outer corners. These, it has been suggested, were foundations for a mekane, a crane that could hoist actors or objects into midair, which was often used for the appearance of divine figures. But based on their position, I think it is more likely that they correlate to a different sort of mekane. Vitruvius and Pollux write of, a cert of certain mekane that could be set up on each side of the stage in order to operate periactoe. These were large triangular prisms painted with different types of scenery on each of its faces. These landscape prisms could be rotated to indicate the change in locale. Finally, evidence for stage effects is indicated by a series of grooved marble plates found in the scanning. A series of consecutive marble plates were arranged in one of two parallel lines that seemed to have run the length of the skein. These slabs were set just inside the frame of the skein's middle door and center intercolumniation of the <coughs> interior column. Crucially, a shallow groove was cut into the middle of these slabs, which ran the length of the arrangement. Fossum, who documented the now lost plates, reasonably concluded that these were in fact tracks for an akeklem associated with the Skene's third phase. This stage device was comprised of a wheel platform that could be rolled onto the stage from within the Skene as a means of conveying interior action. I now turn to the implications of, implications of the theater's unusually deep second level performance space. Most, most Hellenistic skenes are characterized by a long, narrow proscanian roof with a depth of only two to three meters. At Eretria, the depth among the various reconstructions leading up to its final phase ranges from six to 12 meters. This depth allows for more props and perspective scenery to convey a more persuasive illusion. It also provides for trajectorial performance in three dimensions rather than a more lateral performance style in relief. Finally, it provides for substantially more performers. At its size, the Eretrian Skene could conceivably even accommodate a dramatic force. Other elements of production are more certain. The deep stage necessitates a more hyperbolic style of acting in order to continue effectively to continue to effectively convey meaning. This means more exaggerated gestures and movement, as well as a need to project more than usual in the delivery of lines and singing of songs. It would have been similarly demanded, it would have similarly demanded more of stagecraft. Masks, costumes, and props would have been more vivid and pronounced in order to be effective from the deeper Eretrian stage. Clearly, through the epigraphic and architectural evidence, a picture of a distinct local dramatic tradition begins to emerge. But se several questions remain. Was there drama on Euboea before the end of the 4th century? How long was drama appreciated on the island? Was satyr play performed locally? Was, drama perform was the drama performed contemporary? How did masks and costuming evolve? And finally, how do the answers to these questions compare with the Athenian tradition? Some insights can be found through comprehensive analysis of small-scale terracotta sculpture. Terracotta was the most popular medium for the representation of drama throughout the late classical and Hellenistic periods. Its cheap cost of production makes it the best representative of how local dramatic performances impacted spectators on all levels of society. It is unusually durable and found in a wide variety of archaeological contexts. Terracotta representations of drama can therefore help illustrate relationships between the theater and local domestic, religious, and funerary spheres. The figurines capture an otherwise fleeting spectator experience. They are particularly helpful in gauging the popularity of specific genres, dramatic tropes, acting styles, costuming, stock character types, and elements of stagecraft. Terracotta masks suggest more nuanced details of characterization and human psychology. 
Most importantly, the mobility of figurines and masks also makes them useful in tracing the influence of other regional traditions. My study builds first and foremost on the work of Dorothy Bird Thompson. Bird Thompson's isolation of the attic style provides a crucial methodological framework for distinguishing regional core plastic styles and for tracing their evolution. The cornerstone of her study is a group of 14 locally made comic figurines known colloquially as the New York Group. This group was found in a grave of the Athenian Agora and can be dated to the first quarter of the fourth century. This group not only plays a critical role in establishing the basis for the Athenian choroplastic style, but as Webster demonstrated, in reconstructing contemporary Athenian drama. Thomas Bertram Lonsdale Webster studied the theatrical figurines from the Athenian Agora and Panix to develop an idea of how they might map onto local performance culture and stagecraft. He facilitated similar studies of other regional theater traditions by organizing his comprehensive catalogs of Greek dramatic monuments according to regional types, among other things. J.R. Green has contributed to this database and used it to great effect in demonstrating how regional variations of theatrical figurines can inform our understanding of non-Athenian dramatic traditions. Based on his work with dramatic figurines, we now have notions of the regional theater associated with the Corinthiad, Boeotia, and Cyprus. When it comes to Euboea, however, Webster's catalogs are somewhat lacking. There's only a handful of objects included that have a Euboean provenience, and many of these are cataloged as either Attic or Boeotian. What's more, the few assigned as local type are included in an overly sweeping regional category that includes the Aegean Islands, Western Asia Minor, the Blacks, and the Black Sea. Surely, Euboea had a much more distinct local tradition. Here, the recent contributions of Maria Hidiraglu have provided critical insight. Hidiraglu has made substantial strides in the area of Euboean core plastic studies over the last 15 years. We now have a more precise idea of Euboea's core plastic tradition defined by manufacture methods, local clays, stylistic choices, popular types, and complex functionality. Because of this new research, it is now possible to explore how the theatrical terracottas among the Euboean corpus inform our understanding of the island's local performance traditions. To this end, I conducted a survey of theatrical figurines and masks that have a documented Euboean provenience or likely Euboean origin. The survey considered 35 objects in collections at Calchis, Eretria, Karistos, the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, the British Museum, and the Louvre. Data points included context type, location, and date, place of manufacture based on clay, fabrication technique, and fine context, regional type, stylistic date, and size. Data points pertaining specifically to theatrical production were a dramatic genre, character type, and mask type. Details of costume and props were also noted. Most of the objects studied were small in scale, ranging from about 4 to 22 centimeters in height. For those that had documented contexts, most were found in burial or votive contexts in Calchis, Eretria, and Karistos. These contexts were Hellenistic or Roman in date, but based on their heights and type, Several objects date as early as the first quarter of the fourth century. Many were decidedly manufactured in Euboea, though the influence of Athens and Boeotia is evident. All three dramatic genres are attested to some degree, but comedy is by far the best represented. This should not necessarily be taken to reflect local genre preference, since this distribution is indicative of dramatic monuments across the Greek Mediterranean, regardless of region or time period. For the representations of satyr play and tragedy, more effort is made to preserve the dramatic illusion and de-emphasize the theatricality of the images. As a result, I have no doubt overlooked some evidence of you being tragedy and satyr play simply because I could not make a case that the objects in question were linked to theatrical production. 
The most frequently represented character types included young men, young women, male slaves, and satyrs. Most of the masks can be assigned to the common types listed in the ancient catalogs of Julius Pollux and synthetic catalogs developed by Webster. The costumes reflect contemporary fashion and is usually comprised of a hymation draped over a ketan. Most notable among props depicted is the stage altar, which appears to be put to use in its familiar comic function as a sanctuary for slave characters. These broad observations are important, but their value is tempered by the varying degrees of contextual information that we have for the cataloged objects. For some, we have only a limited notion of their original context. For others, there has been little analysis to inform the likely place of manufacture. As a result, not all objects in my survey have equal value in informing our understanding of beauty in theater. I privilege the objects that with the best documented context and which have received ample autopsy of clay and technique as a basis for their origin. It is on a selection of these objects which I will focus for the remainder of my time. I begin with the figurine that represents crucial evidence for the early production of drama on Euvia. This figurine was excavated from a grave in Karistos dating to the second half of the fourth century. It depicts a, a draped, standing comic actor playing a female role. The actor faces forward with their head tilted slightly downward. Bent, drawn in arms, pull the actor's hymation in front of their face. The legs are straight and feet shoulder width apart. Enough details of an elaborate hairstyle are visible to classify the actor's mask as Webster's Mask B. This will later evolve into what Pollux calls the second pseudocore. The figurine has a large distended belly and wears a long ketone under a hymation which is draped diagonally across the body and over the head. Clay in context suggests local fabrication, but the figurine type may have derived from an earlier attic one. This type is represented in the New York group and dates to the first quarter of the fourth century. This type is very common and has been found all over the Greek Mediterranean. The differences between it and the Euboean figurine are slight but impactful. The attic type gazes upwards rather than downwards and draws only one arm to the face rather than both. The figurine's possible derivation from a pre-existing type paired with its distinct modification suggests that it can be reasonably linked to performance. A choroplast would not have bothered to make the alterations to a model unless the details mattered. In the case of theatrical figurines, Details added idiosyncratic recognizability linked to specific performances. The better a choroplast is able to capture an iconic moment or distinct character, the more likely it is that they can capitalize on the enthusiasm of theater goers wishing to conspicuously express their theatrical needs. We should assume that this figurine's choroplast made the alteration to be more emblematic of a particular performance. The use of a pre-existing type as a model for a different performance makes good sense when possible. It saves substantial labor in a fabrication context that requires a quick turnaround and whose subjects work from within a familiar repertoire of gestures and poses. The figurine's link to performance is important because its local production paired with the fact that this particular variation is attested nowhere but Eubea, means that it represents some of our best evidence for the representation of early local theatrical performance. What then can this figurine tell us about the drama it represents? The distended belly is an indication of padding. This is a costume feature that is narrowly associated with the comic genre. At least, and at least for female characters, it fell out of use by around 325 BC. This belly padding therefore attests to local comic performance in the late classical period. 
this type of mask, as far as we can tell, tends to be reserved for young female characters. In images of performance that can be linked to known characters, the mask is often worn by hetairai and would-be hetairai who are eventually discovered to be marriage-eligible citizens. The closest visual comparandum with this figurine, for which we have some dramatic context, are the surviving images from Menander's Perique Roman. In this mosaic, a veiled glycera, a would-be concubine turned marriage-eligible citizen, looks down in shame as she raises a hand to her face. This mosaic captures a scene where glycera has been put in an impossible situation. She cannot fully defend against accusations of infidelity without jeopardizing her brother's fortunate lot in life. We might imagine the Euclidean figurine capturing a similar character type and scenario but it is difficult to speculate beyond this. A similar value can be placed on this figure, which signals the development of local drama in the early Hellenistic period. This figurine was excavated from a Christian grave of the second century BC. It shows a draped, seated actor in the guise of a male comic slave. <coughs> the actor sits with their head tilted slightly to the left. A raised, bent right arm cradles the side of the head, while a bent left arm extends across the sternum to support the right elbow. The legs are crossed, with the right ankle resting on top of the left. The mask can be, li the mask can be likened to Pollux's leading slave mask. There is only slight belly padding, and the costume is comprised of a keton and hymation. The actor sits on a rectangular altar crowned with ionic volume. Here again, clay and context suggest local fabrication, but it is possible that it was based on an earlier foreign model. A slave seated on an altar was an exceedingly popular trope for terracotta figurines. There are in fact at least 34 variations that have been cataloged. But, like the previous figurine, this particular variation seems to have a degree of localization. The other two examples of this exact type were found in Eretria and Boeotia, and seem to be near copies of the uh, Christian example. This figurine also constitutes compelling evidence for the local production drama. The mask and costume confirm that this figurine represents a comic production. Unfortunately, because the mask type is one of the most commonly occurring in visual representations of Greek theater, it does little to inform our understanding of the figurine beyond the fact that it is a male slave. The mask falls into what Webster and others would classify as transitional, representing a gradual evolution in mask aesthetics that occurred in the second half of the fourth century. A date within the last quarter of the fourth century is further suggested by the minimized belly padding and the fact that a phallus is not visible. With the altar, we can imagine here a scenario like the one dramatized in the surviving fragments of Menander's Perinthia. In this comedy, a slave named Dathos takes refuge at an altar to escape punishment from his master. Given the date of this figurine type and the honorary uh, face in Eretria, it is even conceivable that this figurine in fact captures a local production of Menander's comedy. This terracotta mask indicates a continued appreciation for new comedy in the 3rd century, but also signals that Euboean dramatic production kept pace with contemporary developments in stagecraft. This mask was excavated from a Christian grave dating to the end of the 3rd century. The mask depicts a young woman from Greek comedy. The mask has a full, young face with a straight nose, the hair is gathered up on top of the head and arranged to leave a triangular shape visible on the forehead. Tresses on the sides cover the ears, and traces of red pigment also survive. These are the characteristics that define Pollux's full-grown Tyra mask. Clay and context again speak to local production. The fact that it is a mask rather than a figurine paired with the lack of punctured pupils means that we can probably situate this object within the 3rd century. 
We could perhaps associate it with the 3rd century traveling comic performances that are outlined in the Calchas Decree. Comparanda suggests that this mask type may have been primarily used for Hetaira characters. While the mask signals continued interest in new comedy in the 3rd century, it also importantly demonstrates that Eubea remained on the cutting edge of stagecraft development. Like the contemporary developments in Athens and elsewhere, this mask shows an awareness of the so-called new style masks that adopt Lysippan aesthetics. Masks of this new style were slimmer, more natural looking, and increasingly idiosyncratic. More obvious indicators of masks of this type can be readily seen in this Eubean example, that can be readily seen in this Eubean example, are the squared face and the prominent lazy eyelids. By the later Hellenistic period, we also get more firm evidence for the appreciation of satyr plays. These masks were excavated from graves in Eretria and Calchis, uh, dating to the late Hellenistic and early Roman periods. Their size and style suggest they date no earlier than the second century BCE. In Athens, satyr plays were linked to the production of tragic trilogies. We might suppose that the local production of tragedies, as is attested in the Calchis decree, also presumes the production of satyr play. <coughs> Nevertheless, definitive satyr masks provide much needed supporting evidence to confirm you be an interest in this ill understood dramatic genre. Masks such as these three show sustained local interest in all three dramatic genres in the Roman period. These masks were excavated from a series of graves in Calchis that date as late as the 2nd century CE. Based on their stylization and form, the masks can be dated somewhere between the 1st century BCE and 1st century CE. The first represents a wreathed comic slave wearing the mask of Pollux's leading slave, or wavy-haired leading slave. The next is a mask of a young satyr, distinguished from the youth only by its bestial ears. The final mask may derive from tragedy and represent a young woman correlating to Pollux's long-haired pale mask. These masks are important because they show how uh, they show that local interest in the theater survived the island's tumultuous incorporation into the Roman province of Achaea following the dissolution of the Euboean League. They also show that Euboean drama continued to stay current in its stagecraft. We can see this especially in the excessively oversized trumpet mouth of the slave mask and in the increasing stylization and height of the Ancos of the tragic mask. The local production of theater, it seems, probably continued at least into the first centuries. Looking at the theatrical choroplastics of Eubea, in addition to the epigraphic and architectural evidence, I have presented an analytical reading with an eye towards understanding the drama represented and its broader impact on our concept of Eubea's theatrical traditions. Understanding how Eubeans consumed dramatic performance through material memory demonstrates more clearly than ever that Eubea's local dramatic, more than ever the island's local dramatic identity. Eubea had an agonistic and itinerant theatrical tradition, which included the production of comedy, tragedy, and satyr play. Based on the available evidence, the local production of drama can be pushed back as early as the first half of the 4th century, and seems to have extended at least into the 1st century CE. Eubea clearly had an appreciation for Athenian drama. Evidence suggests that Euboean drama and stagecraft remain current, and so its relationship with Athens may have been more competitive than it was dependent. With this reconstruction, we have a better notion of the theatrical atmosphere in which Achaeus, Miniscus, Lycophron, and Apollodorus honed their craft before finding fame elsewhere. As more Euboean core plastics continue to be studied, a more refined picture of Euboean drama will emerge.
I was wondering the context for a lot of these, uh, like masks and terracotta figurines. Are they found in graves, or are they found in other? Uh, most of them are found in graves. Uh, I'm, most of the ones that are most useful to me have been found in graves. Um, I'm, I know that there is a bunch in votive contexts uh, that the contexts haven't been quite figured out uh, enough for me to use yet. Uh, but the thing with these figurines is they, these are, you know, they're final contexts. Um, I'd imagine with these figurines, uh, I'll go back to this one. Uh, stylistically, it dates to uh, the last quarter of the 4th century, early 3rd century, but its fine context was 2nd century. So, with figurines, they can be copied a lot. This one's height. Um, I think it's probably an early generation one. But we can imagine they were picked up as souvenirs, uh, passed down, appreciated, before they ended up in a more final context, such as Boda Pit or, or Graves. But yeah, Graves and Boda. <laughs> so this is a little nice thing you buy and you know, I think so. You, yeah, or we might deposit it or as a Boda, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we, we really don't know, but it seems to be uh, the obvious answer is that they, these are theater chops. <laughs> so I know you're focusing on um, comparing the Athenian tradition with uh, Evia, but I was wondering if you had looked outside, I mean, how do these figurines compare with other regions of the Greek world? Do we find the same kind of variation or interest in forging local identity in the pockets of the Greek world through terracotta figurines? Or have you, is, it, is that <laughs> too far outside of your... your uh, yes, your I think so. Um, and Green has kind of already opened the door with this, and there's lots to be done. Uh, kind of pick a region that it probably hasn't been looked into. Yeah. Um, but certainly Corinth, um, and uh, yeah, uh, Corinth, Boeotia, certainly. Um, but what's interesting, I, in doing this this work, I kind of thought if you know it was based on an earlier model, um, it's probably <coughs> this lengthy performance was that I. But as I continued working through it, I kind of decided, you know, why why would they make these changes unless um, unless they meant something. Uh, so it's complicated and it's really challenging to associate these with performance because you got to have <laughs> so many things going right. <laughs> Uh, so I'm walking a very fine line here, but uh, yes, there there are there do seem to be distinct uh, regional variations, even on Athenian figurines. The Athenian figurines they explode all over the place, and I think they're very popular and they're very convenient, even for representing local drama, um, because you've got a nice mold right there. Just, that was that was very very book provoking. I was, I'm wondering because like you know going around the museums this year, uh, these figurines look you know terribly familiar from all over the place. And I'm wondering because we do know the Hellenic period we start having the professional troops of actors. Do we have any ethnographic attestation of troops that you know work in Euboea and then go to other places? So these figurines can also be connected with like some sort of this is something with a troop. Yeah. Uh, I think that would be smart on their part. Um, <laughs> the Calchas decree, it doesn't seem to have any stipulation that these be local troops or that they be local poets. Mm -hmm. um, some people even think that they brought their own choruses rather than went around and trained local representatives. Um, but we don't know. What's really interesting about that too is if there's no stipulation of that, are they writing their own scripts? And we can't really tell whether these local productions are still Athenian or not. We kind of need more more evidence <laughs> to start to be able to distinguish them. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it would be smart if they had their own core class. And uh, this figurine, for example, there are um, copies kind of exact height uh, elsewhere. But um, enterprising core class uh, who wanted a quick turnaround and aren't associated could easily, especially in in UB, 
Sophia could go to a production, say, in Caristos, pick up a figurine, uh, copy it, make a second generation, mm -hmm. and have a whole ripped off series ready to go in Eretria or Catechese. Uh, it would be also be fascinating to be able to trace the movement of the troop like you would notice in world in time. Yeah, and this, that, uh, that inscription is, is really, really useful for a lot of things like that. Um, it's, it's kind of this proto example of uh, Aristotle's <coughs> <clears throat> Do you think, um, I guess I'm betraying my ignorance of new comedy, that these, um, is it the case that the text of old comedy versus new comedy, that old comedy is very specific, historical, inside joke, and that new comedy is more generic and these simple, simple themes that can be, yeah. and so the figurine story, is that correct? Absolutely. Oh. Um, so familiar characters, probably familiar poses and gestures, uh, which is why figurines can be used all over the place, as well as the plays, they can be transported. But that being said, um, there's pretty strong evidence that Aristophanes is being performed um, 50 years after his lore in southern Italy, um, looking at face painting. So there was still interest in these plays, um, even if they didn't <laughs> probably didn't understand the new ones. Uh, but certainly with, with new comedy, uh, it was very easy to transport. Maybe put something to it, put something together in my mind by showing us the theater and the, and these figurines together. It's so interesting because I remember crawling through this tunnel <laughs> the theater, and everyone says it's so that you could enter onto the stage. But wearing costumes and, and these giant masks would it really be practical to, to enter by your hands and knees into the theater? And are there other ways? That this might have been used. Doesn't the Nander have a play where there's a character down a well? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you, wouldn't you know, have, have yes. communication <laughs> from below the stage in other ways than, than that this was for entrances? Yes, um, certainly. And it had also occurred to me, based on its orientation with the Theater of Dionysus, it opens that back wall. So it would certainly be like a, a very dramatic religious festival type entrance um, for anything like that going on. Um, Certainly for productions of uh, Aeschylus' Persians or Euclid's Deems, where we've got these uh, ghosts appearing, it would have been great there. Um, I think at Corinth, well, yeah, at Corinth, there's a the thought that the, the two Caronian steps were used for animals to bring them on stage. Uh, and yeah, certainly something like falling down the well um, would be perfect. I assume they took advantage of it for whatever they could. Um, yeah. I, I have to say, I was thinking the same thing, but I, I would expect there'd be some sort of structure over the end of that, and you'd have a you know a dresser there so the actor curls through, then you put the costume on them really quickly and they emerge. I would think they would not be able to emerge in that emerge from that hole in the full <laughs> costume, but if you had some way to a box, a house, a structure, or something there that they could come up into and dress, I would think would work better. But. Um, I also, uh, thinking about the, the depth of it, I, I, when we had been there <laughs> together, I, I'd assumed that it actually went much deeper. Um, it looked like it had been filled in. I think there was a tire in there at the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> some beer cans. <laughs> I, I assume it was, it was much more, especially if they got those belly paddings and butt padding. <laughs> yes. I think that you're right. I think it was never completely excavated, if I remember correctly, the, the report. So maybe it was quite... I'd love to see what's there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a there project that needs to <laughs> I have some observations to help you in your, in your research. The first one is about, I don't know if you know the um, uh, figure of Menedemos, the philosopher in at that time. And we know from Diogenes Lertius that his father was Kenographos, and himself, before becoming a philosopher, he was, uh, he was working to make Scenographia. So he wasn't exactly working for the theater, 
and for this kind of thing. That's in Diogenes Letius. I don't know we say it in English, but Diogenes. Uh, and so, and is exactly in the same time when the theater is built. So there is a big coincidence. That's great. And <laughs> it's, so it's at Eretria too, then? Yeah, it's because it, it's an Eretrian. Well, so it's just to add a thing, we also know that Menedemus knew personally Menander. So we know that Menedemus for a while went to Athens and knew Menander and knew he, he was uh, a lover of Menander's dramas, so a dress, comedies. And this, this <laughs> Menedemus, in the late 4th, early 3rd century, he becomes the most important citizen in Eritrea. He's really he, he also was a friend so with Menedemus, as Valentina said, but also with uh, Antigonus Gonatas. So he made many embassies around in Egypt with the Ptolemies to the Mac Macedonian court. And so he was very influent in the city. And I think there was, it could be maybe a relation between the construction or the reconstruction of some phases of the theater with this personality. So you, you should uh, read Knopfler, he would publish the Menedemus life and explain all this. Uh, History. And that must, that could be we can give you the red right <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, and I knew that Menedemus, uh, he actually had a Seder play written about him by Lycophron as well. So he's got his, he's very involved in the drama. Yes, yeah. uh, wow. And there's a probable relationship between him and uh, Menander. I mean, he knew personally. He went to Athens and he spent some time there uh, attending. And another info, uh, observation is not yet published, but in my PhD I worked on the poetry on, from the excavation of uh, Isla in the theater. And what I observed is that the second phase with the koilon, uh, that is dated around 300 BC, it should be dated a uh, generation before. So I think that the koilon was built directly with the first uh, skinny. And there is no differentiation between a first kidney and an empty area in front of it. Okay. Uh, but that's that's something that I will uh, publish in my PhD. That's uh, a new hypothesis about the theater. And it's just the, the poetry was dated by um, Elisa Ferroni a little bit later. And this whole thing made it made this very strange reconstruction with the first building without any place for the spectators. Can I ask you a question about this? <laughs> <laughs> The, so there's this foundation here that you can't see on this plan, but I think it's associated with that first scanning, and, and as I understand it, it's, it's very difficult to know what to do with it. Um, I, I don't know for the skinny building. Okay. I, there is for sure two phases, and I don't know how to understand the different uh, datation. Okay. But just for the koilon, I think that it, has, it's, it belongs to the first phase of the skinny around the 325 BC in this period. There's no reason that. Um, that the seating and the skinny need to coordinate. Yeah. So you could have more phases in the um, skinny building. In fact, you would see more life in the You have more phases in the skinny building yeah. than you would have in the seating, in the seating you, you once you get permanent seating. And that would be what you see with the theater Dionysus and the other Athens. And I have a question about um, your study of um, iconographic material. Uh, have you had a look to poetry? Not yet. Um, and I think that's where I can get some answers for tragedy. But that is, it's still very tricky. I have to make a compelling case that all the iconography lines up enough to, to justify looking into particular tragedy that we know something about. Um, and I don't know what's available uh, from probably a retria, I would assume you have the most. Uh, but uh, yeah, the There are some paper <laughs> already published, and uh, again, with my PhD, I uh, prepared the publication of many uh, mummy bows and cups with uh, emblemata with. Um, different uh, people with masks or tragic faces, uh, stuff like that. So I can show you if you want once uh, what I have uh, this material. Absolutely. So that could be very interesting to compare also with Athens, mm -hmm. because uh, with the material of the Ag Athenian Agora, we know what Athenians had in their poetry set, uh, with what kind of representation. And this could be compared with, I 
did nothing for in my PhD about that, about iconography, <laughs> but if you if would like to, to do it, it would be interesting to compare also pottery and only figurines.